The art of the movie speech is a complex one. Writers can't spend a hundred pages and a few hours on a single oration as in real life a skilled orator would do. They can't repeat what's already known to the audience and they can't, somehow, be too brief. How's one to write a great movie speech? To find out, we'll go through the magnificent speech at the end of Steven Spielberg's Amistad, written by David Franzoni, creator of Gladiator. Are you not entertained? Of course, we'll need the movie's context. We know we ain't high coming to see you, sir, but... Well, aim lower! It's 1839. Sin K, a West African who was kidnapped and sold into slavery, leads an insurgence against his captors aboard the schooner La Amistad. They're captured and brought to trial in the United States. The Queen of Spain, Isabella II, who's 11 years old, declares the prisoners are to be returned as her property. But two abolitionists hire Baldwin, a pre maconnaissance Matthew McConaughey in a very maconnaissance type role, to defend that they're not slaves but free men illegally taken. President Martin Van Buren fears that if the Africans are not considered property, it might lead to civil war or worse, losing his re-election. So he sides with Spain and dismisses the judge who was swaying to Baldwin's side. Then the new puppet judge also sides with Sinke and Baldwin and declares the Africans free. Van Buren appeals to the Supreme Court now. Damn Van Buren. I'm taking on the entire Van Buren boys. There's a street gang named after President Martin Van Buren? Oh yeah, and they're just as mean as he was. And Baldwin manages to get former President John Quincy Adams to defend the case. And the speech he gives is out of this world. The challenge. Adams is to persuade nine justices, seven of whom are southern slave owners and all of whom fear civil war if the slavery issue is exacerbated. Let's ignore how these characters speak of a problem that wouldn't come up in 20 years. And why do I rate this speech so highly? Rhetoric, rhetoric, always rhetoric. All writers should, nay, must study rhetoric till their eyes bleed and they can't ask for the salt without five anaphoras. Whoever works with words must learn the classical art of persuasion. And in this masterful 10-minute speech, David Franzoni and Anthony Hopkins will leave you speechless. Good point, though. To fully understand what makes this great speech great, let's frame it under the five canons of classical rhetoric. Here they are. In modern English, we call them invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. As you should expect, this speech excels in all of them. But let's begin from the beginning. Our canon friends will catch up. In classical arrangement, the structure of your speech, we start a speech with exordium, a simple introduction. This is the place to establish ethos, or authority, why the audience should listen to you, winning goodwill. Adams is a respected lawyer and a former president, so he doesn't need to boast. On the contrary. I derive much consolation from the fact that my colleague, Mr. Baldwin, has argued the case in so able and so complete a manner as to leave me scarcely anything to say. He feigns some humility. Everyone wants to be seen as the underdog climbing up a hill, fighting for what's right. Who wouldn't side with that? However... That's good enough, so we move to narratio, a clear and concise presentation of the facts. And by facts I mean, of course, your version of the facts. Adams starts that part of the speech with five rhetorical questions. Why are we here? How is it that a simple, plain property issue should now find itself so ennobled as to be argued before the Supreme Court of the United States of America? You'll have to forgive my breaking the perfect rhythm for brevity's sake. I mean, do we fear the lower courts which found for us easily somehow missed the truth, is that it? Or is it rather our great and consuming fear of civil war? There has allowed us to heap symbolism upon a simple case that never asked for it. Then he speaks of truth and uses two similes. And now would have us disregard truth, even as it stands before us, tall and proud as a mountain. First, truth stands tall and proud as a mountain. Comparisons to nature are common and irresistible. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Second simile. The truth in truth has been driven from this case like a slave, flogged from court to court, wretched and destitute. Truth was flogged from court to court like a slave. There are similes and not metaphors because of these small words, as and like. A tiny rhetorical distinction. Comparing truth, an abstraction, to a slave, a person who can be flogged, wretched and destitute, also makes it prosopopoeia, a personification of ideas. Finally, Adams frames the case thus. Yea, this is no mere property case, gentlemen, I put it to you thus, this is the most important case ever come before this court. Because what it in fact concerns, the very nature of man. And so he ends the narratio part of his speech. But before we move on, I want to point out his wordplay with truth in truth. The truth in truth has been... Just some fun style for style's sake. 
Style is one of the five canons. It includes the vocabulary, the rhythm, and the register. Rhetorical devices are a part of style called ornamentation. Adams uses a lot of them. I'll keep pointing them out as we go on. Another part of style is its type. How elevated is your language? The great Roman orator Cicero names three types of style, plain, middle, and grand. Earlier in the film, Baldwin, defending the case as a simple property issue, argued only in the plain style. This case isn't about murder, mayhem, or massacres. It's not about anything that dramatic. This case is about knowing the difference between here and there. That's what it's good for, stating facts. In this speech, you'll see that Adams uses all three. Interestingly, Baldwin cited Cicero to convince Adams to join the case, committing a crass mistake. Cicero once said, appealing to Claudius in defense of the Republic. I imagine Adams accepted partly just to correct him. Cicero's appeal was to Julius Caesar, not Claudius. Claudius would not be born for another hundred years. Ah, Claudius. My viral video. Please like and subscribe so we can get another one. I'm also on Patreon. Moving on. It's time for refutatio, the part of the speech where you refute your opponent's assumptions. These are transcriptions of letters? I didn't mention the first canon of rhetoric. Invention. That's how you describe your argument, that is, your whole strategy. In this case, Adam's stance is that this isn't a property issue, but a discussion on human existence itself. It's the very nature of man. Invention also includes the sources of proof. Here we have the most boring kind. These are transcriptions of letters written between our Secretary of State, John Forsyth, and the Queen of Spain, Isabella II. Hard evidence. Aristotle calls it a source of proof that doesn't really require invention, like a witness or a document. I love how the first thing that comes to his mind after a witness is TORTURE. <laughs> These things don't involve rhetoric, so they're not sexy to talk about. The Queen again and again refers to our incompetent courts. Now what, I wonder, would be more to their liking? A court that finds against the Africans? Well, I think not. By the way, what's that he just did? Now what, I wonder, would be more to their liking? A court that finds against the Africans? Well, I think not. That's hypophora. Asking a rhetorical question and answering immediately. Now this here is primordial. Water. Without a hydrated throat, you can't speak well and long. What Her Majesty wants is a court that behaves just like her courts. Now it's time to mock the child queen and he puts on the middle style. The courts this 11-year-old child plays with in her magical kingdom called Spain. Which has room for ornamented language. A court that will do what it is told. A court that can be toyed with like a doll. In this case, he uses the device of conduplicatio. A court, as it happens, of which our own president, Martin Van Buren, would be most proud. That's the repetition of a word like a motif. You place it in multiple parts of the text, coming back to it here and there as your major theme. Now this is a publication of the office of the president, and it's called the Executive Review. We get another non-creative source of proof, another document, presented in plain language. And I'm sure you all read it. At least I'm sure the president hopes you all read it. We have room for metanoia. That's when the speaker breaks the flow to correct himself. And I'm sure you all read it. At least I'm sure the president hopes you all read it. It feels casual, like the speech is not memorized, but spoken from the heart. At least I'm sure the president hopes you all read it. And Anthony Hopkins' brilliant delivery here and throughout. I'm not merely complimenting this acting genius. I'm talking about one of the five canons of rhetoric. Delivery. It's the voice. Hopkins will speak loud and soft. There is a loudest. It's the very nature of man. He will speak fast and slow. To heap symbolism upon a simple case that never asked for it. Our own president. Playful and grave. <laughs> Could it be? And now would have us disregard truth. It's the use of gestures and facial expressions. Adams reads the executive review, a pro-slavery document clearly mocking its claims with his voice and face. Slavery has always been with us and is neither sinful nor immoral. And it's time for confirmatio, the part of the speech where you present your claims, the time for logic and arguments. John's claim, offering that the natural state of mankind is instead, and I know this is a controversial idea, is freedom. The natural state of man is freedom. Here's the good stuff of invention. Appeals. Unlike hard evidence, they are the artificial or artistic sources of proof. Because they require art. There are three appeals. Ethos. Authority, and we went through it. Logos, logic, and pathos, emotion. 
One way to use logos is through induction. You find an example that applies to your case and build a conclusion out of it. In this case... It's freedom. And the proof is the length to which a man, woman or child will go to regain it once taken. Man is willing to fight valiantly for freedom. Therefore, freedom is the natural state of mankind. Might be debatable, but who would want to side against the very concept of freedom? That's a damn fine argument. He will break loose his chains. He will decimate his enemies. He will try and try and try. Anaphora. This is the most famous rhetorical device. The repetition of a word or phrase in the beginning of each clause. He will try and try and try. And here's Epizuxis. An immediate repetition of the same word. Almost always three times. Against all odds, against all prejudices. Another anaphora. To get home. This memorable passage in the middle style has only 27 words. 17 are repeated words. John Quincy Adams paints a difficult, hard-fought battle for survival with words. And where does it end? Home. Saying, hey, would you stand up if you would, so everyone can see you. Speaking of fighting, he moves the subject to Sinke. Now, if he were white, he wouldn't be standing before this court, fighting for his life. If he were white and his enslavers were British, he wouldn't be able to stand. So heavy the weight of the medals and honors we would bestow upon him. Of course, there's repetition involved for even greater effect. As well as strong imagery. Strong imagery with hyperbole, no less. Songs would be written about him. The great authors of our time would fill books about him. And in his flight of imagination, John adds epistrophe. That's the anti anaphora Repetition at the ends of clauses. The repeated word here is him. It leads us to expect that the very last word of the paragraph will be him. But this orator is even more brilliant. His story will be told and retold in our classrooms. Our children, because we would make sure of it, would know his name as well as they know Patrick Henry's. After hammering and hammering and hammering Sin K, him, on his audience's head, he concludes with the founding father who famously said, Give me liberty or give me death. Now, in the audience's mind, he and Sin K are the same idea. Yet, if the South is right, what are we to do with that embarrassing, annoying document? Declaration of Independence. Here's my favorite part of this speech. What on earth are we to do this? I have a modest suggestion. How often do you see a gesture that's both physical and metaphorical? Symbolically, he's staring the Declaration of Independence in half, something his audience would never want. But concretely, he's staring the executive review, which he's been holding for some time. You don't want to tear the declaration, so tear the review instead. The other night I was talking with my friend Sinke. We march to our conclusion at this point. Peroratio. This must be the part of strongest pathos. The part where you sway the audience to your side and leave them with the emotion of your choice. John starts off in the plain style, casually narrating. He was over at my place and uh, we were out in the greenhouse together. And he was explaining to me how when a member of the Mende, this is people. That's called apexegesis, a brief explanation in the middle of your speech. If you can think of something, there's a rhetorical term for that. Go on. Think of something. There's only one canon of rhetoric we didn't go through yet. Memory. All alone in the it's, you know, remembering the speech. That's natural memory. Then there are techniques you use to enhance your memory. Followers of the channel, you beautiful people, will no doubt have noticed how interesting is the scene's blocking. How Anthony the Great under Stephen the Great walks all around the court. It's not only good filmmaking, it's a way of literally remembering the speech. This document is here, so it's that part of the speech when I talk about it. Here's Sin K, so it's the part of the speech when I talk about him. I walk to the Declaration of Independence on the wall, it's that part of the speech. I walk back to Sin K, so it's time to begin my peroratio. And now I walk to the busts of the Founding Fathers. It's that emotional conclusion to the speech. Linking a place, action, position to the text. That's artificial memory. Even the direction is rhetorically brilliant. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington. John Adams. This transcendental portion of the speech features a grand use of the grand style. We have long resisted asking you for guidance. Perhaps we have feared in doing so. We might acknowledge that our individuality, which we so, so revere, is not entirely our own. Savor this passage. But we have come to understand. This is not so. We understand now. We have been made to understand. 
to embrace the understanding. Repetition elevated to high art and what stands out is polyptoton. That's the repetition of the root of a word. If it was so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously have Caesar answered it. A word repeated in different grammatical forms. Understand and understanding. That who we are is who we were. Chills. That's my comment about this passage. Chills. We desperately need your strength and wisdom, triumph over our fears, our prejudices, ourselves. A little more in Afro and he concludes this speech by twisting the fear of civil war into a noble desire for it. Give us the courage to do what is right. And if it means civil war, then let it come. When it does, may it be finally. The last battle of the American Revolution. So solemn and honorable is this part, you might not even notice how fallacious is his argument. Basically what he's saying is that the founding fathers, his actual father included, would theoretically be on his side and therefore so should the audience. That's the fallacy of argumentum ad verecundiam. An argument demanding respect for an authority. Hey, you know these awesome dead dudes we all worship? They totally side with me, you know. You know you're in a great speech when even a fallacy is used well and elegantly. That's all I have to say. Overall, what has John Quincy Adams said to the justices? That if they find against Sinke, they're lower than the lower courts. That there'll be no more than Isabella and Van Buren's playthings. That Sinke is a hero worthy of the highest praise and that if they find in favor of Sinke, they will be following the footsteps of the Founding Fathers. That's all I have to say. Earlier in the film, Adam said that the winner is the side that tells the best story. I realized after much trial and error that in a courtroom, whoever tells the best story wins. With such courage and heroism, you can't have a better story than the one he told here. In only 10 minutes, in only 1065 words, David Franzoni and by extension Anthony Hopkins and Steven Spielberg teach you everything you need to know about the art of the movie speech. There is nothing left to be said besides thank you for watching and thank you for listening. In unlawyer-like fashion I give you that scrap of wisdom free of charge.